Welcome to Acts chapter 6. Now chapter 6 is quite a bit shorter uh, than some of the other chapters that we've looked at previously but there are still some important issues that come out of it uh, in terms of the development of the early church. So we're going to look at the chapter in two sections verses 1 to 7 and then verses 8 to 15. So let's start with the first seven verses and we've got enough time this week to read some of that section through. In those days, when the number of disciples were increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Up until now, all that we've heard about the early church has been really positive. All the wonders and miracles, how they shared their possessions, how they prayed and broke bread together, and how they were all of one heart and one mind. But at this point, we get the first indication that that early church may not have been perfect. These are the first few hints that there was an internal issue uh, between the Jews from different backgrounds. The Hebraic Jews were the more traditional Jews who spoke Hebrew and Aramaic and worshipped regularly in the temple in Jerusalem. Whereas the Hellenistic Jews were the ones who came from further afield and spoke Greek. They'd come to Jerusalem for the Pentecost festival and got involved with this new church as it emerged. And these two groups came from very different backgrounds, perhaps with slightly different interpretations of the Jewish law and different expectations of this new church. Now, whether there was an inconsistency in the way that the widows were being treated or whether it was just down to, to different perceptions and expectations, we don't know. But friction had started within this group and friction within the body of Christ is never a good thing. I don't mean by that that we should all agree on everything all of the time because that's not healthy either. And I remember that I was part of a Methodist circuit who were looking to form a mission partnership with a neighbouring circuit. It wasn't a merger like many other Methodist circuits have done. It was just so that we would work more closely uh, in mission together. And we had a celebration service to celebrate this partnership. And the district officer led us in some prayers. And he prayed that we wouldn't agree on everything because he said then we would seek God's will more fervently. I've always really valued the person in a meeting who spoke against what the general consensus of the meeting was, because that challenges us to think. Maybe we haven't got it right. Maybe we need to keep thinking on this issue. Maybe there's another way. And even at the end of the meeting, if we do go with the majority thinking, at least we've thought through these alternatives to ensure that we are actually on the right path. A church which agrees on everything may not be the healthiest of churches, but a church with friction certainly isn't healthy. When people stop coming to church or a specific church, it's often because they've fallen out with someone or because so-and-so said this or that, or they don't feel that their needs are being met. And so people leave or they stay, but they stay a bit disgruntled and the rifts just keep getting bigger and deeper. Now, I don't know how you stop disagreements within a church. Wherever we have 10 or 50 or 100 or 200 people together, there's gonna be personality clashes but surely church is about more than individuals and personalities. It's about forgiveness, 
It's about grace and it's about working together as the body of Christ in that place at that time. As Methodists, we say in our covenant prayer, rank me with whom you will. And if we're really serious about that, then we need to work out how we work alongside those people who we might not have chosen, but who God has called and called us to be part of the body of God together. The church is about more than disagreements. And that is why the disciples reacted in the way that they did. They didn't have time to sort these problems out themselves. They needed to be focused on the word of God. But the apostles didn't dismiss the problems as, as irrelevant or petty. They set up a team to deal with them. And one of the problems that the early church must have had is in its rapid expansion. If you think about it, one day there was 11, then it, it grew to, to maybe 30 or 40, then hundreds, and it says at Pentecost there was 3,000 of them. How would you cope with such expansion? It would be an amazing problem to have, unusual, but amazing. But along with this came issues. You don't need much of a structure when you've only got 11 or 12 people. But by the time we're in the hundreds and the thousands, then there needs to be a structure in order to look after the needs of the people, which was a big part of the early church. And so rather than the, the original 12 dismissing the problem, they came up with a solution. They would appoint seven people to deal with the day-to-day -day issues and running of the community so that they could concentrate on prayer and on God's word. They laid hands upon these seven and God must have approved of that decision because we read that the word of God continued to spread and the numbers kept increasing. So what can we learn for our churches? from this part of chapter six. Well, firstly, that disagreements need sorting out and not left to fester. But there's something in here too about ministry and about gifts. What do we expect our ministers to do? Now, if we were to do a survey of congregations, even just within Methodism and ask them, what do you expect or what do you want your minister to do? I wonder what the list of answers would be. Some may be obvious, like preaching and leading worship, chairing meetings, caring for the congregation. Some might be more strategic jobs, coming up with strategies and vision plans and implementing them, managing the finances and looking after the building. Some roles may be more pastoral, visiting church members, visiting the church groups that meet on the premises, being present at church events and possibly helping to set up and clear away and, and do the dishes at such events, leading prayer meetings, looking after funeral families and ensuring uh, that their services are, are well prepared. Other jobs are more administrative, always to be in the office when somebody wants to call and ask something implementing safeguarding and GPD, GDPR and health and safety and risk assessments. And then what about mission, working with children and young people, leading the mission work into the community? And then there's teaching, uh, leading Bible studies, preparing people for confirmation, baptism, weddings. And that's not to mention providing cakes for bake sales, uh, sometimes playing the piano or sorting the music and a whole lot more tasks. If we had a job description for ministers, then many of those things would be on the job description. And is it any wonder that many ministers, especially in smaller churches where they're often expected to take on the role of treasurer and property secretary too, is there any wonder that ministers burn out? And who can be an expert in all of these fields? It is an impossible task and so I'm really grateful that churches are realising this now and providing more and more help and support and safeguarding our ministers. But the apostles realised this problem early on. 
They were called to spread the word of God. That was their focus. And when they were enabled and free to do that, the church continued to grow. God calls the church family to be the body of Christ. And each of us have our own role. Working together is the only way that this can work and enabling our ministers to minister and to focus on prayer and sharing God's word. Now, Tom Wright, rather, unhe rather unhelpfully, I found, said that there is a temptation of ministers today to shy away from the difficult work of preaching and teaching and to prefer to do less demanding tasks. Now, I disagree with this, and this is unusual for me to disagree with Tom Wright, but let me explain why. I love maths. I went to university to do a maths degree. And OK, I came out with a theology degree, but my intention was to go and to read maths. And I have to say that right up until the end of A-levels, I found maths quite easy. It wasn't an effort at all. And I have to say that I'm more proud with the C that I got in A-level physics than I am with the A that I got in A-level maths, because physics was hard work. Now, I know that for some people that's not the case. Maths is not easy at all and they struggle even with basic concepts. And that's fine because we all have different gifts and we all find different things easy and difficult. I could no more write a geography essay or draw a picture or play a concerto than I could fly. And I don't think that ministers have in their minds what is an easy task and what is a more demanding task and deliberately choose the easier ones. But I do think that ministers will lean towards things that they feel that their natural talents are engaged in. Now for Tom Wright, writing books and commentaries and doing research is where his natural talents seem to lie. I'm not implying that it's easy for him, but that's where he seems to be very gifted. I could not write a book that is a fact. I would naturally choose to spend more of my ministry time in areas where I feel that God has given me the gifts. But sometimes that's not possible because ministers are so stretched thinly trying to accomplish all those tasks in the list that we just thought about. Now, just before lockdown, I was particularly aware of this, that I never felt that I had enough time to properly research and prepare and think through the services and the sermons that I was writing. And I've learned so much from what I'm sharing with you now about Acts. And it has been fabulous to have that bit more time to be able to do this research, to do this thinking. But if I want to continue this once our churches start to reopen, then what am I going to have to give up? What of that huge list of tasks for ministers Am I going to have to say, no, I can't do this because this is a different area that I want to focus on? And this is not just about ministers. I give that example because that's personal to me. But we all have our calling and our gifts. And often as a church, we try to fit round pegs into square holes. When a vacancy comes up for a job in church, we look around and see desperately who we can grab to fill the vacancy. Maybe we need to do a skills and gifts audit as a church and think, what gifts do we have in the people that we have? And are our people deployed in the best places? Do you know what I'd love to do after lockdown when we go back to church is to cancel all jobs in the church. I'm not going to do this, um, but just to say, right, we're, we're going to cancel all roles and we're only going to have those that are absolutely necessary. And we're going to sit and think about who are the ideal person to have in each of those roles. Why would you have a talented, a talented pianist making the coffee when there's nobody in church to accompany the singing? Why would we have an organiser and a planner visiting the sick? Now, all of these are worthwhile jobs. None of them are more important than any of the others. But have we got the wrong people in the wrong places? Are you in the right place in your church? 
Are the jobs that you are doing suited to the gifts that you've been given? Or do you feel underused or overworked? Maybe that's something we can reflect on in this part of the chapter. Because when they got it right, when the early church got it right, the church continued to grow. And the second part of today's chapter is verses 8 to 15. And this is all about Stephen. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. We've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Stephen was one of the seven who had been chosen to help with the management and the day-to-day -day running and looking after the widows in the early church. But then straight after, we read how Stephen was doing miracles and great works and wonders and signs among the people. Up until now, it had only been the apostles who'd been doing the wonders and the signs, but it seems that now those who'd had their hands laid upon them were also performing miracles too. It was almost as if this faith that they had, um, this being filled with the Holy Spirit, just couldn't be contained. It was so infectious and it, it spilled over from their lives and it just had to be shared. And Stephen spoke with the power of this spirit. But there's another key change here in the way that the early church was working because Stephen, for the first time it seems, goes beyond the temple courts. Again, up until now, the teaching that had been done by the apostles and especially the teaching that we read of of Peter and John was within the temple courts. But now Stephen was taking the message to the Greek-speaking synagogues. These were still Jews that Stephen was speaking to. But it's the start of opening up this new world of faith to the rest of the world. It's like God wanted to give the Jews, and especially the Jews in Jerusalem, the first chance to respond. Since it was uh, the Jews that God's inheritance was intended for, this new kingdom, they were the, supposed to be the inheritors of it. And so they started in the temple. And then they've began to reach out now to the synagogues, and we'll see how this progresses throughout Acts. But Wright comments that this audience which Stephen was preaching to was different to the audience uh, which Peter and John had preached to in the temple courts. But yet there was a similar reaction. These Jews in the synagogue were not like the Sadducees in the temple. The Sadducees had a lot to lose if it turned out that what the apostles were preaching was true. They faced losing their power, their authority and their influence. But these Hellenistic Jews in the synagogue didn't have that same power. They didn't have the authority and the influence. What they were defending from these early church apostles was their worldview, their way of seeing things. Jesus was a threat to their very way of being, their very way of living and thinking and of how they did their faith. But now they were presented with Stephen, who was obviously a man of spirit and of faith and of wisdom. And yet what he was teaching was contrary to what they'd been living by. And so they really only had two choices, 
to admit that Stephen was actually right in what he was preaching and to change their ways or to throw as much mud at Stephen as they possibly could to get rid of him and to remove the threat. And they chose the second option. There's a little bit of irony here that the Jews were accusing Stephen of possibly breaking the law. And yet the one thing they do in response was to get false witnesses, which was definitely against their law and against the Ten Commandments. And you may notice here a few echoes uh, with Jesus and his crucifixion in terms of the crowd being stirred up and false witnesses being brought. And so it's not really looking very good for Stephen. And yet his face was like the face of an angel. And Barclay suggests that this countenance shows that God was with Stephen. He was present in Stephen and that authorised Stephen to speak as God's messenger. And Wright says that as Stephen faced these accusations, he finds himself standing in the overlap between heaven and earth. So what can we learn from Stephen? Well, I think one of the most important points of this account for me is that as Stephen was being accused and as the, the synagogue leaders were, were arguing with him, the Spirit gave him such wisdom as he spoke. God was at work in this situation. Everything was against him. The leaders were stirring up opposition. People were bribed to lie and spread untruths. And yet God's spirit was with him and shone from his face. Also, we learn that he was taking God's message to the next level. Maybe the apostles had gained all the converts that they could get in the temple courts. Those who had open hearts enough to hear had joined with the early church. And those whose hearts were hardened were never going to join. So, so maybe they'd done the work that they could in the temple courts. And now Stephen was taking things on to the next level, trying a new battle plan. And it made me wonder that as a church, what is our battle plan? Do we have a mission plan? And what is that mission plan for spreading God's word? And is it working? If it's not, then what is our next step? Where do we need to go next? Or how do we need to do things differently in order to up the game and tell more people about Jesus? So we have a shorter chapter in chapter six, but still plenty of challenge. Firstly, thinking about disputes in our own church or areas of neglect. How can we reform our church? How can we structure things differently to truly be the body of Christ and enable everybody's gifts and talents to be used to their full? And what is our role within that church? And then secondly, thinking about Stephen and how he took the next step in sharing faith. He went to the next level and tried something new, reaching out in a different place to a different audience. And even though he faced opposition, he knew it was the right thing to do because God gave him the words and God shone through him. So what is the next level that we need to move to in our mission in order to share the word of God and to share our faith? And do we trust God that if we're doing his will, then when we face opposition, he will give us the words we need. Next time, we will be looking at chapter seven, and that is a much longer chapter. So it might help you to have read the chapter through before tuning in to our next Bible study video. And so as we reflect on those questions for today from chapter six, and as we continually strive to do God's will and to find his will and his work for us, then may God's love guide us and shine from within us, shine through us as it did through Stephen.